So my name is Daniel, and this is Julien. Uh, so we both work at Zangularity, which is uh, the company which originally created the Play framework. Uh, so I suppose you know it. Um, so we are, we are a consulting company, and we, now we mostly build web services, REST web services for our customers. Uh, and we came here to share with you uh, some of our experience in building uh, such web APIs. Uh, well, however, uh, we'll be talking about JSON protocols and, and documentation, uh, but it's not, uh, our goal is not just to have a success story. Hi, hi well, how is, that's how we did it. Isn't it cool? Uh, instead, we'd like to share you also uh, some of the deeper insights uh, in the ideas behind it and some useful patterns which we hope you could also use um, in your own projects. So based on the context of, of JSON uh, codecs. Okay, so, uh, so the, the context is that we have web services now, who doesn't, uh, which obviously consume and produce JSON to communicate with each other. So we need to, to be able to, to marshal the data, to serialize and deserialize uh, the data. But we also need some kind of documentation, uh, either user documentation, which we can publish on the HTML site, or some machine readable documentation, which we can use in truly REST APIs. So for example, if we consider as uh, a simple common like this to buy an article, uh, we might need to be able to encode uh, it in JSON. So I don't know how, how much of you have uh, a Scala background, perhaps? All right. Uh, how many of you write in Erlang, perhaps? Cool. How many people know what the type class is? Cool. That should be fine. So, well, in Scala, we could, we could have a syntax like this to give an a by article command to encode it uh, in an AST, a JSON AST. We can also have a decode um, method. Okay. Which, well, as we can see, it's, it gets quite complicated. And if you want to decode one field, we have to decode both of them. And then if everything's right, we can only uh, create the data. If something's wrong, we might like to accumulate errors. So of course, nobody does it like this. There is a pattern uh, in, many, in many libraries, which we'll C see. Can you, can you just explain what is the return type? Yes. So the return time will be the sum type of where we either get a, uh, a decoding error, right, uh, porting the uh, decoding errors, or we'll get uh, the by article command. Yeah. So if we serialize it, that might be the representation we'll get in JSON. OK, but what about documentation? Here's a citation I've seen recently. Uh, and I think it may also apply to REST APIs. Many people say they do REST APIs, but actually, uh, REST is not only about HTML and JSON, like many of our customers think. Uh, well, I won't be going into depth, but one of, the pr one of the fundamentals is also to be able to, to have some machine readable uh, schema of, of the data we are exposing. So for example, uh, with our by article command, we may want to, to have a schema documentation like this. So this is only a simple example. In practice, we might be using some technologies like JSON-LD uh, or other ones. But this could be enough for our case. So we know what the type, what the fields of our object, of our JSON object are, uh, what their type is, and perhaps what are the constraints. OK. Uh, but the problem is that we have codecs, which, uh, which are programs in order to serialize and deserialize data. And we also have documentation. And uh, the question is how to keep both in sync. So some people start with documentation, with a specification, and try to implement an endpoint. Some other will just first implement and then produce some documentation or not. Uh, in both cases, we need to keep both in sync. Uh, so a change to, 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 to one of them has to be ported to the other. So I have a big risk. This is usually manual and error prone. So we'd like to, to avoid it. OK, so what's our approach? Uh, the pattern we want to show you is how to use a common model to be able to both derive the implementation of our codex, but also derive some documentation. So actually, well, the, deep, the, the, the deeper insight is that we want to use functional programming to separate a program description from its interpretation or its evaluation. 
So what we'll be talking about now is, um, well, first, we'll have a quick overview of, of uh, what is the shape of, uh, of uh, JSON libraries uh, in Scala, and so how we can avoid uh, the cumbersome code we have shown, uh, I've shown this before. Uh, then uh, we'll show you how we can combine the description of, of a codec with its documentation. Then, if time's allow, uh, we'll perhaps show an alternative. Uh, Bartosz this morning uh, showed, talk, talked a bit about, uh, about generating uh, boilerplate free code uh, using Scala macros. We'll show you how can this be done with, uh, with type level programming using shapeless. And finally, we'll try to look at the deeper pattern, uh, which is common uh, in what, what we'll be talking today, and how to extend it and add uh, additional interpretations of an existing description of, of an existing model. Okay, so there are many Scala libraries, uh, either in the Play framework or outside of it. Uh, well, we won't be speaking ab about any of them in particular, but we can assume that the, we have uh, a trait similar to this one. So basically, it's a trait. It's, it's a trait. It's a parameterized by an input and an output, and we want to be able to encode uh, one type into the other and the other way. So obviously, when we <coughs> encode, things can only go well. However, when we decode the input into the output. Well, we might have some parsing errors, some validation errors, some business rules. So in, in uh, either case, we need a type to, to, to express uh, that possibility, and this is either. So either we get a decoding error or we get uh, the output type. Okay, so that's how we could write a codec which uh, is able to, uh, to serialize and deserialize an integer into JSON. Um, so for example, we might, uh, assuming we already have some abstract syntax tree for JSON, uh, we could check if, uh, if it's the JSON number uh, and then uh, uh, try to pass it, because usually that will be a big decimal. So we, we try to, to cast it to int, otherwise we can accumulate the different errors. If you want to encode it int, it's, it's fairly easy. And similarly, we could have uh, other basic codecs like building blocks. So we could have a string codec to, to encode and encode a, a string. Uh, we might have a codec which uh, actually produces JSON objects, so nested um, tree structures with fields. We, can, we might also be able to express some constraints. For example, uh, we might want to say that an integer is, uh, has a minimal value, and we can also express it as a codec, as a transformation from int to int which may produce an error at the decoding level, which will then uh, carry the, the business rule. Okay, then we can have combinators, which is uh, we can take several existing codecs and try to produce new ones. For example, we might want uh, to chain codecs. So we want to apply first one, uh, one transformation, then another, so it's a bit like a pipe. Uh, we might also want to just transform uh, the output type, so uh, we might have a method imap, right, which takes the output and is able to, uh, to transform it into something else. Okay, and then using these basic building blocks and the combinators, we are able to, to describe uh, more complex structures. For example, we might say that in order to um, in order to have a codec which uh, extracts the article ID from our JSON, we first look for the field article ID, and then we chain the result uh, with a string codec. With quantity, we may do the same, but add an additional constraint. So that's much clearer than the code we saw at the beginning, uh, and it still carries the same amount of information and does exactly the same thing. Okay, so, uh, we might use also some object-oriented techniques uh, <coughs> well, to, spe to specialize the codecs we want to do. For example, we might have an object codec uh, where the output type is, is, an, is, is a JSON object, so we may have um, a more specialized field combinator which creates the, 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 the right codec to encode and decode a field in a JSON object. OK, 
Okay. We, we might also zip two object codecs. So um, we might want to try to decode one codec and then decode the other. And if everything's right, we combine the results. However, if there's an error either in the first on in the, or in the second, then we accumulate the errors. So I think everyone familiar with type classes will recognize the pattern here. All right, so finally, we can use all these combinators well, uh, as a DSL, uh, so a domain-specific language, uh, to actually describe the structure of the data we want to, to have. So we can say that uh, a by article, the codec for a by article uh, is, uh, is consists of first zipping two fields with some constraints and then emapping the tuple into some case class uh, to okay. change the type. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, sure. Well, actually, you could you could use you could you could have different combinators, uh, which express alternatives. Yes. So I might want to first try <coughs> to decode one representation, and if it fails, we can move to to an older one, etc. Sure, you can do that. You could do that. Okay. So essentially, all um, well called JSON libraries or XML libraries in Scala look pretty much like this. So we have some ba basic building blocks, and then we have a DSL and combinators in order to construct more, more complex uh, <coughs> uh, programs. So codecs are transformable, are composable. Uh, and actually, we could think of them as a program written in that uh, domain-specific language. OK, so what about documentation? To keep things simple, we might uh, consider uh, an abstract, uh, an algebraic data type like this, uh, where uh, things can either be a scalar, an object composed of fields, uh, or a constraint, like mean value, or perhaps uh, chaining several operations. So using such an uh, algebraic data type, so we, we could also define some basic building blocks, for example, an integer, a string, or a date with a specific format. And then we could combine them in order to, to, to describe the documentation of, uh, of this by article command, right? So actually, the data we want to, to, uh, to have um, in, the, in our web endpoint is an object with two fields of a given type uh, satisfying some constraints and perhaps with some human readable documentation description. OK, so now we have, so we have these two, uh, two different ways of expressing basically the same thing. So first, we have a codec which, which expresses how to encode and decode uh, a Scala object into an JSON object. And then we'll also have a second description which describes the, uh, the structure of this object. So we can, you can see that there is, uh, there is a parallel between them. The structure is very similar. And we are kind of repeating the same things. Uh, so the idea now is to try to unify those two descriptions into a single one. Yes, OK. Are there any questions so far on codex and documentation? Because all the remaining of the talk will build uh, another thing uh, on top of that. It seems OK. <coughs> so we want to uh, aggregate together the feature of having a codec and uh, having a documentation. So let's just define uh, a trait for that. Um, a trait which is parameterized by the input type and the output type. We called that a protocol, and this protocol has um, uh, a codec and a documentation. So now <coughs> we want to define an API that will allow developers to define their JSON protocols. So we have to think about what we want or what we need to be able to express, to define such protocols. So for instance, what, uh, one thing wh what we, that we want is to be able to transform uh, the output of a JSON protocol into another data type 
which is maybe easier to work with. So for that, we need an operation that transforms a protocol from A to B into a protocol from uh, A to C. And we, we will be able to do that with two functions that maps the B to C and the other side. <coughs> um, and I name this uh, method emap uh, by reference to uh, an abstract structure named invariant functor, which is very abstract and theoretical and inaccessible. But we will see why I do so. Uh, another thing we want to do with our uh, protocols is to able to chain them uh, so that the, the output of the former protocol is the input of the latter. And uh, <coughs> to, to do that, we, we, we define an operation and then which takes a protocol from A to B and one from B to C and produces a protocol from A to C. This operation is named and then uh, by reference to uh, an euro structure, which is again an abstract and inaccessible thing. <coughs> so at that point, you might be wondering, okay, why bother with this abstract and inaccessible theoretical uh, thing? Um, and that's a, a very interesting point. And indeed, um, for users, it's not needed at all to be aware of these things. But I think, uh, and for the record, uh, this, uh, this work that we are showing to you, we, um, we built it uh, for a project, a real world project, and the people who are using our DSL are just regular developers who don't have a PhD in computer science and who are just focused to, to, do, to get things done in a practical way. And, and they are totally able to, to and they, ha they are happy to, to work with our DSL, uh, even though they don't know the underlying theoretics theory. But for uh, uh, DSL designers, I think it's important uh, to be aware of, uh, of that at least for two reasons. The first one is consistency, so that um, if several DSL designers um, want to express the same kinds of operations, it's better if they are named the, the same way, so that people uh, can get easier uh, an intuition of uh, what th these names mean. And also for reasoning about the expressive power of um, uh, a DSL. For example, I can just say, okay, a protocol is an arrow, and then another uh, language designer will understand, oh, okay, so, so we can chain uh, two protocols with, and, with uh, and then. Okay. <coughs> um, and now, um, so I, I've shown how to define JSON protocols, and now I want to specialize our uh, concept of protocol for the case of object, of JSON object. So um, I just uh, specialize my protocol trait into an uh, object protocol. And uh, in that specialization, I force the codec to be an object codec and the documentation to be an object documentation. And this new object protocol has different properties, has new properties compared to just protocol. For instance, it has this uh, zip method that allows us to um, define uh, an object protocol in terms of the protocols of each field of a JSON object. Okay? So again, this method uh, uh, refers to uh, an abstract uh, theoretical uh, structure named Cartesian, which has just one operation, zip, that, that takes uh, a protocol of something and a protocol of uh, another thing and produces a protocol that uh, yields a tuple, a tuple of uh, the two things. <coughs> Maybe you have heard of Monad and Monad are very sexy in functional programming, so maybe you are wondering, 
is a protocol a monad? That's a legitimate question. And it turns out that a protocol is not a monad. And actually, it turns out that we do not want a, pr a protocol to be uh, a monad because we want to be able to statically reason about, uh, not statically reason, but to statically uh, describe, document uh, a protocol, <coughs> a JSON protocol. Uh, if we try to implement this flat map operation, which is the essence of monads, uh, if we try to implement it for object protocols, um, we wouldn't be able to supply this A value uh, in the case of documentation, because documentation doesn't produce values. So we would not able to produce this F of B value, and we would not be able to, to, to get the full uh, documentation of a JSON protocol. So we don't want it to be a monad. <coughs> so, so far I've explained uh, how we can combine protocols together, but uh, we, we first need actually um, uh, building blocks to be combined together. So in the same way, we were able to define um, a primitive or basic codex. We can define basic uh, protocols. For example, a protocol that um, encodes and decodes a JSON to string values. We just use the string codec and the string documentation. And similarly, we can define uh, protocols for int values and for constraints and so on. Um, the, the field um, building block um, has a new parameter, that's the description of the field, which is needed to, um, to populate the, the description of the field in the documentation. Okay, but that's basically the same idea of the, the field codec that we have seen earlier. Okay, so that's enough uh, material for now. Uh, let's see how we can use it. So this code above is um, the unification of the, the two code examples that we have seen just uh, a few slides ago. <coughs> so here we are again seeing the, saying the same thing, that a by article JSON object has two fields, article ID and quantity, uh, the first one is a string, and it even has a description. And the second one is an integer value, which must be greater or equal than one. And it has a description. And finally, we um, transform the, the values of the two fields into a nice uh, case class, uh, which is easier to work with. So you might think, OK, we can unify uh, the codex and the documentation, but still, the, the syntax is a bit uh, hard to use and a bit cumbersome, but hopefully we can improve that and we can define, for example, uh, infix operators to make things easier to read and to write. For instance, <coughs> we can do that for and then. So we can define this kind of operators. And we can also um, uh, de define a more convenient syntax for the combination of zip and imap. That would give the following syntax, for example. That's a, an example of what is possible to do. <coughs> so here we, we, we say that we have two, these two fields, and we combine them together to, to uh, return a by article. And finally, we can even have the, this kind of uh, nice uh, fluent DSLs that uh, reads even better. And actually, that's really close to what we, we are using in production. <coughs> um, let's give uh, another uh, example of how to use that. 
So um, consider the, the, the above the following definition of the biarticle uh, JSON protocol. We can define an instance of a command like the like the above, and then if we encode it in JSON using our protocol, and if we decode the the resulting JSON, hopefully we we get back the um, initial uh, value. If we try to decode uh, an invalid JSON, we get back uh, an error here. And uh, we can encode uh, a given command, and we get this JSON value. And finally, we can also print just the JSON structure of a uh, by article. And it gives just exactly the, the same result as we have shown in the first slide. Um, OK, uh, what time is it? It's OK, I think. OK, I think I will go a bit fast on this section. But <clears throat> so, so far, we, we have seen how, how to um, uh, define JSON protocols for our data types. And when we are just um, working and when we need to deliver fast our software, it can be seen as a, a cumbersome task to define both a data type and its JSON protocol. So we also set up um, a system to, um, to build instances, instances of JSON protocols for data types in a type directed way that is by reading the type the, the the nature of the type of our data we are able to define um, a corresponding json structure so we just do a mapping um, between the type data type field names and the json field names <coughs> so to do that, we need to be able to abstract over the data type, uh, the algebraic data types uh, structure. So we need to remember that an algebraic data type is defined in terms of some types, which are uh, sums of product types. And um, we will work on this uh, abstract representation of uh, al algebraic data types to define our um, uh, process that uh, builds uh, JSON protocols uh, according to uh, the structure of an algebraic data type. <coughs> I won't go into the details of the process because I think we have no, we don't have enough time. Uh, I just want to notice that. Um, uh, this kind of uh, very generic uh, programming is not supported yet by the Scala compiler, so we are required to use uh, a library to do that. And this library is named Shapeless. Um, so I will just keep that. Okay. So, and, um, so wh what have we done? We have shown how we can um, define models of JSON protocols using plain Scala code. So it's important to notice that uh, we, we can use all uh, the Scala linguistic features to define our JSON protocols. We can use val definitions and reuse the result of a val definition at several places. We can use uh, functional abstraction to, to define uh, uh, protocols in, um, in a modular way. <coughs> and um, this uh, Scala code um, uh, so represent a, a definition of uh, of a JSON protocol, and then we can have several um, semantics for this uh, JSON protocol, which are the the codec and the documentation. Okay, 
And <coughs> oh yes, we were able to reason about the expressive power of uh, this embedded language uh, that allows us to define JSON protocols by using uh, well-known type classes. So now one problem remains. That's the fact that um, both the, um, our protocol uh, tightly couples the fact that uh, a protocol has uh, a codec and uh, documentation, and both are tightly coupled. And you might wonder if it's possible to, to define the semantics independently of each other. And that's uh, the topic of the next uh, part of the talk. Yes. Okay, so uh, from one side, we, we've achieved to unify a codec and a documentation. Uh, however, at the same time, we've also tightly coupled one with the other. Uh, for example, what if, if we need to change anything in the algebraic data type which represents the documentation, uh, we, might also, we must also go in the code which, uh, which implements the codex. Um, if, um, if you if would like to, to introduce a new interpretation of a protocol, for example, we, want, we might want not only to have a codec, but also have a JSON doc documentation, perhaps an HTML documentation, and perhaps uh, a class diagram of the same data, and we must go again in the protocol and add more and more structure uh, inside. Also, uh, like, like, uh, like Julia, uh, Julien said before, uh, different interpretation may need different expressive power. For example, uh, in the case of documentation, we, we can't have monads, and it's also quite hard to reason with uh, re recursion, for example. However, with codecs, that shouldn't be a problem. So really, uh, it would be nice if we, if we could uh, still have the, a common model, but be able to have uh, different semantics, so different interpretation of the, same, of the same program written in a single DSL. So how to do that? There are several approaches, uh, among which three applicatives, uh, object, uh, object algebras, and finally tagless uh, generalized uh, algebraic data types. Um, and these are uh, several approaches and techniques uh, which make it possible to define a model uh, separately from its interpretation. And I'll show it on the example of object algebras, which most of you must know from under a different name. Uh, I think everyone knows of abstract factory design pattern from the Gang of Four book. Uh, so basically we have uh, several types of products and, and an abstract factory simply defines uh, several operations which uh, either produces uh, uh, products of the corresponding type or does some operations on them, right? Uh, and a concrete, a concrete implementation, a concrete factory will simply refine and provide implementation for the different products, and also bind all these implementation into a common uh, type family. So basically, uh, that can then be used by a client, right? So a client can be able to, to define what it wants to do independently of the factory uh, which is provided. So it might want to, to first create a first product and create a second product and then assemble them. And the same code works whether this is a factory for bikes or a factory for cars or, or airplanes. So actually, object algebras can be thought of as uh, abstract factories uh, in the sense that all the basic blocks, all the basic operations uh, we, we might want to have in the DSL is like the products of an abstract factory. And all of our combinators, these are the operations. Uh, another way of looking at it uh, is it looking, well, actually the L in DSL stands for language. So we might consider the grammar of a DSL. And we get exactly the same thing. Abstract factories, object algebras, and also the grammar with terminals and productions. These are all isomorphic. So, uh, well, uh, when I think of, of, of a keynote, of yesterday keynotes, uh, perhaps we're really discovering something instead of inventing. It's if we have, uh, so object-oriented patterns, functional-oriented patterns, and also uh, well, uh, formal language theory, which all provides us with something very similar. So the idea is, if we define an algebra, so this DSL in terms uh, of such terminal symbols, right, an integer and string, and we also have operation, emap and zip. So whatever the actual semantics is, 
right? So here we capture the semantic as a type constructor f. Uh, we can write a program using such an algebra. If only we have an algebra, whatever the exact semantics is, are, we are able to use the DSL to construct a structure, uh, which is a program. Uh, in, this, in that case, we take an integer, we take a string, and we zip them together. Thanks. Uh, but the advantage is that we can def decompose the different features of algebras we might want to have. Uh, so for example, we can have some, uh, some basic terminals common uh, for, different, for different algebras, right? So with integers, strings, and other basic types. So we might have uh, other algebras which provide the semantics of an IMAP operation. However, we might also want an arrow algebra. And you can remark that the arrow algebra has different constraints, right? Our algebra requires uh, semantics with a type of structure which takes two arguments because we need to, ch if we want to chain an f of AB with an f of BC, well, obviously we need two types of parameters. So uh, we are able to, to combine the semantics to describe algebras of different expressive powers. So we may have uh, a weaker algebra which only has some terminals and some and uh, the, the, production, the productions of of an invariant fact functor, uh, or we may have a stronger algebra with, uh, which has bigger, stronger constraints on the semantics, right? Expressed as a type construct in, in the form of a type constructor, but also allows different operations to be made. So, how could we implement such algebras then? Well, for example, uh, we could have a codec algebra, right? This is uh, the uh, the question mark there is uh, it's not native Scala. There is a plugin, uh, compiler plugin which allows you to use type lambdas that way. So in other, in other words, we take the codec, which is uh, a type constructor with two, uh, two type arguments. We fix the first type, but we leave a hole in the type. So uh, we, we end up with a type constructor which takes only one type argument. And that's exactly what, for example, needed, what we needed uh, from, uh, what our protocol algebra needed for us to have an IMAP operation. And then we can have, for example, several implementations, one for JSON, another one for XML, and all they need to, ha all they need to do is to provide the basic uh, building blocks to decode uh, primitives, but we can reuse exactly the same operations we have on codecs independently of the input type. Or we might also define uh, an algebra implementation for documentation, right? So here we can see that, uh, well, the doc uh, trait was not a type constructor, uh, uh, but we can add a phantom type, right? So a type which is erased at runtime and doesn't really do anything at runtime, but allow us to reason at compact time. So we, all we have to do is we'll define the, the basic building blocks uh, and implement the combinators. And you can see that, by the way, we, uh, we've gained some statically typed documentation, which may be, may be useful. Okay, so finally, uh, our implementation of, of a bi-article protocol remains almost exactly the same. All we need to do is pass it an algebra, and given that algebra, uh, using the combinators and the terminals of that algebra, we express exactly what we want to do. And we can also so use some Scala magic with implicits uh, to have some syntactic sugar, and we also get exactly the same, uh, the same uh, DSL as before. However, we can parameterize the semantics of what we want to express. So for example, uh, we may first have only two implementations, just like before, an algebra for JSON codecs, and an algebra for documentation. And we can reuse exactly the same function, exactly the same definition, to either derive a codec for by article or to derive uh, a documentation. And the day we need it, all we have to do is implement a graph algebra or a Bison algebra if you want to have some graph visualization or some codec uh, for Bison. Okay, so well, to conclude, uh, we'll, we have seen uh, how we can use embedded DSLs to describe a program, to describe the structure of, of data and the action of validating of, of marshalling data. And uh, this DSL provides basic building blocks uh, which we can express as an algebra, reason about it, reason about the type classes the algebra represents, and combine 
uh, those semantics uh, to, to have the interpretation we want, either some documentation or a codec or something, something else. Okay, so that would be it. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you've built a very, uh, well, normally complex thing mm -hmm. uh, to solve the problem of having a model or a PTO, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and uh, adding documentation to this, mm -hmm. or a other representation if you want to extract some information. Um, how much added value does this have to, say, use the standard uh, PlayJSON uh, macros uh, to get with Swagger? Uh, well, the added, the, yes, uh, the question was that we implemented something quite complex, and what's the added value, for example, compared to standard uh, Play framework uh, combinators and macros? Uh, well, the added value of shapeless and type level programming compared to macros, well, from the uh, user end point of view, it's is, is equivalent. However, well, the, um, the added value is that we have almost the same syntax as with play, uh, play reads. However, first, uh, the, play, the, the, well, the play API, there is an API for codecs, uh, JSON codecs in, in, uh, in, in, in the play framework. However, the problem is, is that the, the entry type is, fi is fixed, it's always a JSON. So for example, you can't have uh, the arrow semantics, you can't actually chain codecs together, you can't add constraints. Right, so the constraints are, are not possible in, in this DSL. So first, the first added value is that we can have constraints. Uh, another one is uh, that we can use exactly this, well, that extended DSL, used like the DSL of the play codex, but we can also autom automatically derive uh, the adjacent schema for the data uh, the codec represents. So for example, we are able to, to generate some, uh, some types, TypeScript uh, deserializers on, in, on the front side, we are able to, to use this schema to have uh, smarter front applications, uh, for example, uh, which know which fields are required, uh, which are the constraints, we can reason about it also in the front side application. And on the back side, we didn't have to do anything, anything new, we just used a more, a more expressive and more powerful DSL, just like we would have used the DSL of, uh, of Play Codex. Yes? So one of the things you sometimes want to do in the DSL is observe sharing and take it into account. I can imagine that if there's a JSON fragment that was used in many places, you might want to document it once and then refer to that. Have you done anything of that sort? Yes, sure, sure. Uh, well, the question is whether we can document some piece of JSON, some, some object, some data type, once and, and reuse it uh, in different places. Well, that's precisely the idea. Uh, as you use uh, plain Scala to describe a structure, a data structure, uh, for example, if I go back to, to this code, right? So here we've, 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 uh, we've said that a by article uh, is a field article ID, which is a string, and a field quantity, which is an integer, right? And, well, we have a function by article. So right now, for example, we might have a composite comment where the first field is uh, a by article, and we reuse exactly the same, the same function. My question is not that. Yeah. My question is whether you can generate documentation in mm. which every time you use a by article, uh, it just refers to one part, one piece of generated documentation, mm. rather than repeating the documentation of by article each time it occurs. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure to get. So if by, if articles appear in 15 places yes. in the documentation you're generating, mm. will each place say? It's a piece of JSON with an article ID and a quantity, or can you generate the documentation of a by article once so that at the other occurrences it just says, and this is a by article? Yeah, I think I get what you say. Uh, well, precisely, well, the question is whether we can reuse the same, uh, the same uh, interpretation of the documentation in several places if, we, if you refer to, uh, to an article several times. Well, it depends on the of implementation of. Uh, the documentation algebra, uh, which can be very naive. Uh, for example, repeat the structure every time it, it sees it. And then, for example, we have a problem with recursive data types. However, we might also have uh, a, more, uh, a more sophisticated algebra uh, with a state monad, which would, for example, record all the types which it has already seen. 
and accumulate this, uh, this information and reuse it. And for example, that could allow us to have also recursive data types. This? So from an API user point of view, I, I don't understand how, what's it actually going to see. What's the output, like the HTML, whatever API documentation that is produced by all this thing? Is that a, like an example to, to an idea? Yes. Maybe this. This is an this example of what you could get. Yes, yes, but no. This is a JSON fragment that may be uh, the result of um, um, a description of an HTTP endpoint. So we, we, we will uh, REST web services where the, each endpoint is um, self-descriptive. So from the, the root HTTP endpoint, you can know which are the other HTTP endpoints that are available, and then you can know what is the structure of the expected JSON payload to... I understand this bit, I just okay. don't see the whole picture because I think this is only the detail of that particular thing. It's not the actual documentation of the endpoint. That, well, that's, that's not the user documentation, that's what we mean. This is a machine-readable documentation, but in using exactly the same pattern instead of outputting JSON. But you can see that I did by article dot doc dot to JSON, okay? So I, I, I might have had a to HTML which takes exactly the same structure, exactly the same algebraic data type, and produces some pretty, pretty HTML with, uh, with fancy stuff. So this is just uh, a machine-readable uh, schema. But that's, that's equivalent, that's just a different way to print the same, the same information. The point is that apart from building our encoder, right, which is just an exec a piece of software you can execute, we've also captured the semantics uh, at the same time using DSL. Uh, Last would, question. Uh, I would like to ask about the performance. I mean, let's say we, we talk with JSON, uh, with uh, the interface, which uh, pro processes a lot of data. And what's the overhead of the solution? Have you checked it? Uh, of, of using such protocols? Yeah. And uh, all, all the sophisticated mechanisms. Well, basically, it's, it's all compile time, actually. Once, once you, you use an algebra, right? Uh, You've got some. Uh, you, you can reuse the same object, the same, uh, for example, the same uh, JSON protocol or the same documentation object, and, and so you, you don't have to go through all of this construction and the construction every time. <coughs> However, uh, well, when you decode data, obviously uh, you have to go through all the stages, but that's that's the same performance as uh, as other API. Uh, other libraries for, pars for parsing JSON because it's, it's, that does exactly the same in the same way. Okay, thank you. Sorry, we have no time to for more questions. So let's move the discussion yes, you can, you can for afterwards. And thank you, Daniel and Julian.